Ron Toledo is the uh, EVP CTO Master Architect Insights and Data Global at Capgemini. And he's a member of the Capgemini Group Chief Technology Innovation and Ventures Council, AI Futures Domain Lead, lead author of Capgemini's Technovision Trend Series, which if you haven't heard of, you should have, and um, uh, easy to find and uh, highly recommended. He's editor-in-chief of Capgemini's Data-Powered Innovation Review Series, and uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, a return speaker, Ron's spoken a few times for us uh, kindly in the past, and uh, it's great to have him back. So a warm welcome back from the open group, please, for Ron Toledo. Thank you welcome so much, Steve. Thank you so much. No pressure, right? Full no pressure. Provoking and entertaining <laughs> on Monday morning Yes. in a cold Edinburgh. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, so does this actually work? Yeah, I think so. Huh? Oh, that's me. That's an old picture, by the way, but uh, anyway, that's... <laughs> Don't know where they got that, uh, that's 20 years ago or something. <laughs> Still look the same, more or less. So, if you remember, uh, last year in London, some of you were there, maybe, a year ago in London, yeah? So, so this was just, we, we just had the beginning of the whole generative AI craziness, right? It was all uh, a few months before that, in December 22, JetGPT hit the shelves and everybody collectively lost their minds. I guess. All the other topics we were involved in, I was a lot in data, I was working at data mesh, data mesh architectures, and, and, and all of our clients were interested in, in new federated ways of architecting data platforms, and, and domain-oriented data, and, and products, data as a product, and then ChatGPT came and everybody, as I said, collectively lost their minds, and there was nothing else they could think of. But I liked it, and, and last year I said, I, I am a man of very few qualities, if any, uh, no, absolutely, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to paint, for example, but I already had for decades, I had this vision of yellow raincoats that I wanted to put, you know, in, in sort of dystopian type of context and absolutely unable to paint that. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, even really express it to myself. And then I had uh, Midjourney, which was another generative AI tool, of course, which was uh, gaining in popularity. This is all just a year ago. And, and then it, I could still do this as a fancy thing, right? I, I could still show it in terms of, well, this is actually on my mind. People always ask what's on your mind. Well, here it is. And, um, and, and it, generative AI did this. And, and at that time, of course, it was new. Now we're a year uh, down the road, just a year ago, that we actually still could wow the audience in terms of, hey, look at that. This is what I made. And it's generative AI actually that did it for me. And now, obviously, one year down the road, so we're sort of, um, I think beyond the phase of uh, trying to evangelize generative AI, trying to convince people, but, but are actually at the stage in which uh, it becomes a big business, a scaled up business. And that means there's also work for architects among us, I guess, enterprise level architecture. So that's a little bit what I have for you uh, today. Um, Somebody just, uh, well, we were just discussing about presentations. This is one is entirely new. I have no clue how long it would take, typically. I haven't been able to rehearse it. So we were just discussing outside uh, another speaker, and he said, uh, oh, I'm very curious to, to hear what you're going to say. And the speaker said, well, so am I. Um, and <laughs> I have a little bit of the same issue here. Uh, this is entirely new stuff, uh, my friends. Just a picture, the, the previous picture I've used before. For the rest, it's relatively new uh, territory for me. But, but I, will, I will try to uh, convey a little bit what, what I think and also within our company and what we've seen with our clients, what the current faults are around architecture for AI. We know it's an enterprise topic, so we know that architecture sooner or later comes down into the equation and we need it, all right, to, to bring the rubber to the road and, and actually enable change. I've always believed architecture is about enabling change. There's, there's really nothing more to it. We're not in architecture because it's nice to be in architecture. We actually want to enable a change. That's, that's really what we're trying to create over here. Um, by the way, if you like this artwork here, there's a story behind it, actually. This is one of the pictures we've taken. It's actually a cake. Um, you might think it's not a cake, but it's actually a cake. And it's made by this lady. She is a Dinara Kasko. Uh, she is a Ukrainian, actually. She came from Charkiv, and uh, that's not a city you really want to be. She was a refugee, actually um, went to London and later on um, moved further on to San Francisco. Um, she used to be an architect. 
And with architects, I mean not a TOGAF certified enterprise architect, actually, you know, designing buildings and stuff, constructions, an architect. And uh, as you got bored with it, so she decided to, be, to become a pastry chef, which is clearly much more compelling, I guess, and inspiring. So she became a pastry chef, she designed cakes, and then she wanted to have interesting shapes. So she went on to design cake molds, right? Silicon based and other materials, molds for cakes. And then she used uh, generative AI. We went, uh, I was in a, you know, we had a workshop in London with her and we started to brainstorm with her in terms of how can you use generative AI, combine it with 3D modeling and then 3D printing and create cake molds that were impossible, unthinkable before. And that's what she did. You see another example over here, that's actually a cake. So, so um, right now she is absolute uh, big, big hit on Instagram. All the Michelin star chefs follow her, and, and sort of, you know, um, envy her, and, 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 you know, look at her creations, and, and you can buy these molds from her. Uh, but, but the thing is, she was an early adapter, I think, of, of generative AI combined with some other solid, innovative technology, which is still there. 3D printing still exists as well, despite ChatGPT. You know, ChatGPT still cannot print 3D, last time I checked. So she combined a few of these very interesting uh, technologies. What's the key lesson over here? Where, where you know, you're actually leveraging what, what, or, you know, elevating, if you like, what's possible. And that's what I like about AI currently, and particularly, of course, this wave of generative AI that everybody went crazy for. The notion is we can do things that we deemed impossible before, literally impossible before. And um, that is very compelling and inspiring, I think, not only to architects, but of course, right now in 24, after 23, in, in which we started to realize all of this, now in 24, the big question is, how can we actually do this at enterprise scale? And we know then, of course, particularly from an open group perspective, we're, we, we're you know, inclined to think, well, that, that might involve architecture, right? And maybe some standards. As Steve just now said, uh, this might be standards for, let's say, the architectural profession itself and, and building what it takes to build AI solutions. But you could also imagine standards for actual AI architectures themselves, platform architecture, if you like, and maybe both. Um, so, so we've been um, starting to think a little bit about it. It's definitely something that is important right now, right? Be because we've done some research ourselves and, and others have done it as well. And, and it's all very clear that there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. So, so we all know uh, that, that's, as I said, everybody collectively lost their minds, more or less. But, but the good thing is that literally every organization, whether it's driven by hype or false expectations or anything like that, but the majority of it says, oh, we're going to invest big time in it. To the extent sometimes, unfortunately, from a data perspective, that people literally forget about everything else currently. Uh, and now it starts to come back a little bit, by the way. But hey, you know, there's one thing very good, I think, for all of us involved in technology, and, and that is that uh, the elephant in the room uh, can no longer be ignored. We all know elephants, right? And they can be in the room, and you try to ignore them. But nowadays, of course, because of generative AI, everybody has an opinion about AI suddenly, including in the boardroom. And with everybody, I mean, uh, my, my neighbors have an opinion about generative AI as well, and they're around 78, right? And they probably could sell generative AI to an enterprise as well by now. Uh, I mean, everybody has an opinion about it. Everybody's working at it. At school, they're working with it. Uh, everybody's either in denial or completely embracing the whole thing. But one thing is for sure, and, and, and it's been a long time, that technology is so obvious on the, on the boardroom agenda. And we can no longer deny it. And with that comes a whole, I would say, flurry of different technology activities that are not necessarily all AI, but they could be related to AI. As I said with Dinara Casco, uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't just you know, work with ChatGPT and have some sort of a brilliant idea for a new cake mold. You actually need uh, proper and advanced 3D modeling software for it as well. And a free 3D printer that actually can produce silicon cake molds in all sorts of impossible shapes and then be able to ship them, by the way, uh, to all of these Michelin star chefs that do fancy things with them. She also does cake recipes, by the way. If, if you feel the urge after this conference to, to bake a cake, you also may want to follow Dinara Casco. She, she is on Instagram. I'm not sure if she is on TikTok. Everybody seems to be on TikTok these days, but uh, at home we are not. But I have heard rumors that she's even there as well. 
So the elephant is in the room. And, and although it might be based on some uh, clearly uh, exaggerated expectations, because that's clearly what we're currently seeing with a lot of our clients as well. OK, all of the enthusiasm in 23, maybe a little bit exaggerated. But hey, it's the IT industry, so we like to hype up things every now and then and, and maybe have some inflated expectations. But having said that, technology is firmly on top of the boardroom agenda. And there's literally, at least I haven't seen an enterprise where it isn't the case. It, it's, it's almost annoying how many questions we all, probably many of you also get in, in terms of why don't you come over? We need to discuss generative AI, right? Be because there's this big animal over here in the room and it won't go away apparently and we cannot ignore it either. Um, before I go further, I always feel in this, in this era of transparency and openness, we always need to be clear about our sources and also about the people. Hey, we're the open group. This is a merits-based organization. So we're interested in, uh, in our sources, but also in the people. That, that are involved in this. So, so let me start a little bit with the sources. Steve already mentioned it. Um, um, yes, I've, I've been involved uh, a little bit in a trend series, uh, which we call uh, Technovision. Some of you may, may remember, I, I've been quoting it before in the past few years, every now and then. So, so we have a, a merry band of CTOs and other, I don't know, master architects, as we call them internally. And uh, we brainstorm a lot about technology trends. Um, we're about to start already this summer in June for 25, already start to think about what would be hot in terms of technology in 25. And, and the result is always around January. It's, uh, it's a publication uh, that we call Technovision, and there are 37 different trends in it. And that's what we um, do every year. And there have been many themes in the past few years. For example, last time I was in London, I talked about the notion of less with less. We need to be smarter about our portfolio. We need to be more sustainable. There, there is no abundance of resources, both natural and human resources, and also money, right? So we need to make smarter choices with a lightweight portfolio, and it must be more sustainable. And the years before it, COVID, of course, the main notion was very much around agility and flexibility. We called it be like water. That was the theme at the time, or being like water. It was based on a famous Bruce Lee quote, by the way. If you happen to be in uh, the 70s martial arts, which I admit is a niche to be in, but anyway, I, I happen to be in. Um, so, so these were the themes of the past few years, and now we started to think about 24. It's the era of artificial intelligence. It's on the boardroom everywhere. There's this big elephant. It's an artificial elephant, but it's there, and we cannot ignore it. So what will next year, 24, look like? And, and there's something interesting, which I find particularly also a key message for our architects, because it's a, uh, it's a world that consists of two sides. And we were very much inspired by something that happened 55 years ago. Some of you look more or less old enough to have been conscious at that time. I know I was, clearly. This is 55 years ago. It was 1968. It was Apollo 8. Anybody heard of it? No, not Artemis. It was Apollo. Apollo 8, it was the first manned flight, and we sent people in a capsule 10 times around the moon. They didn't land, but they, you know, and actually made it back. Much to the surprise, I guess, of NASA, but they actually came back alive as well. And uh, that was 55 years ago, first time ever. 10 rounds, you know, 10, 10 times around the moon. On board uh, were three people, and one of them was uh, supposed to be the, the lunar pilot, but he had nothing to do because they didn't take the moon lander with them for all sorts of logistical reasons. They were afraid it would take too long or what was too risky or, or maybe Soviet Union would be earlier, so they decided to do it without the moon lander but still had the lunar co-pilot with them, and he was called Bill Anders. And Bill Anders was tasked by making pictures because he has nothing else to do. And so, so he was on board to the lunar module, and then for the first time ever in, in, you know, in recorded history, uh, th there was a picture made of a earth rise. So, so above the surface of the moon, you saw the earth rise. And this is now considered one of the best and most environmental pictures ever taken. And nobody ever seen it before, obviously. Um, so you see the earth in its full glory. And then Bill, Bill Anders came back on what we nowadays call the overview effect. And the overview effect is you're far away from the Earth, you look back, and you start to realize that it's all happening there, and the rest doesn't matter. So we are doing a moonshot here, literally a moonshot. So we're using very advanced technology to do something that we deemed impossible before. So, so we're literally elevating what we deemed possible. And at the same time, 
uh, we realized it's not about that. So Bill Anders had this famous quote. He said, uh, we went out to uh, explore the moon, what we discovered about Earth, right? That is literally what he said. And, and we felt this might be very much the case with artificial intelligence as well. Because we're augmenting ourselves, again, it's like a moonshot. We can do things that we thought would be impossible before, and now we are leveraging what's possible and go in areas that seemed unreachable, thanks to technology. But then we look back and we get the overview effect, and we are rediscovering ourselves as humans, but also as enterprises with a purpose. Because when you make everything artificial and digital and virtual and augmented, you know, the more artificial you are, the more you find out what is still human and what is real and what is the actual purpose of the enterprise, even if it's fully automated, right? Or, or completely, you know, autonomously taking care of business for you on your behalf. Why are we as people? So that's why we chose this, this title for 24. Yes, augment. We augment ourselves, do things impossible before. Good architectural perspective. We love it. Get inspired by it. But it's all around us as human beings. So augment me. And me is in capitals, and augment is in lower, just to make a point, right? And by the way, if you're interested, we had some visual art that came with it, which, which I still like as well. Sometimes it's all about the visuals. Technovision itself contains of so-called containers, seven of them. So we, we categorize 37 trends in all sorts of different containers. In all of these containers, you find a lot of AI. So there's a lot of impact of AI on all these different containers, whether it's in applications, whether it's in process automation, user experience, collaboration technologies, infrastructure. Everywhere you see the impact of AI. And so every container has a little visual. And here you see the augment me thing. Because we, we have a picture in real life, and then we add something to it, right? So we have a car, and it gets wings. So the car can fly, right? It can do things that were impossible before. So we're overlaying reality with something additional. But the way we've done it, we call graffiti. So this is very obviously done by human hands. So we're trying to convey this idea of, yes, we are augmenting ourselves, but it's very much by humans that we decide how we augment ourselves, and in what way. So it's from a spray can, right? We're just spraying the thing in, in a very, uh, I would say, almost punky way. The company that made it up, by the way, comes from London, and are, they are actually called Rooster Punk. Uh, so I, I love that name. Uh, I mean, that, that must be a good agency, right? And they come up with this stuff, which is, I think, a, a little bit uh, Rooster Punk stuff. I like the infrastructure one. You see that? That's a Harry Potter cloak. You see, infrastructure, we make servers invisible. So it's a Harry Potter cloak. You must know about Harry Potter because he was created over here, I believe, in Edinburgh. And if you look around, it's all Hogwarts here, right? And uh, so, so that makes sense, right? We have the invisibility cloak. But applications get ears and they can speak, right? Uh, cars can fly, and so on and so on. So, so we're overlaying, augmenting ourselves with AI. But we do it very distinctively as humans. We decide how we apply this stuff and nobody else. So that's a very nice thing. Uh, as, as some sort of a, where does this all come from? Well, here it is. And if you want to know more about it, capgemini.com slash technovision, so-called intuitive URL. People always ask me, where do you think I can find technovision? Well, well how about capgemini.com slash technovision? You probably don't do it now, but uh, later on, uh, please. Um, you, you'll find all of this stuff. It's all open, of course. Huh? Hey, uh, we're here at the open group. We're not keeping anything to ourselves. You also don't have to register or sell your soul or anything like that. Just you can download it <laughs> and, and don't need to do anything uh, for it. Now, in terms of AI, and I'm sure many of you have experiences with implementing AI solutions, or maybe that's a little bit too much to say. What we've been doing, of course, a lot in 23, and also, I think, still going on in 24, is, of course, the proof of concept level. So we are creating, uh, we are experimenting, and, and we're building, I would say, in the industry, a lot of different AI solutions currently. The big question is, of course, uh, is this at enterprise scale? Is this, is this actually something that is ready to conquer the world, as we have been envisioning and dreaming of in 23, and still dreaming of in 24? Uh, we, we, you know, we, we beg to differ that it's already there. We, we think, if we look around us, and uh, I've seen quite a lot of organizations, and not only from our company's perspective, but you see it all around. Uh, we're still a lot in the, um, I would say, experimental phase, and it's all a little bit isolated. Not exactly what we as architects, you know, like to think as enterprise-ready. And, and why is that? Well, uh, 
we, we just collected a few things, but what we're thinking currently is the case. And it's, it's a very wide range of different type of reasons why, why this is currently uh, happening. Uh, of course, uh, it's still very rapidly changing. Then there's another model that is being launched and it's superior to the other one. Should we take that one, right? Uh, then we start to realize that infrastructure actually costs money. I mean, NVIDIA is having a field day these days, although their stock value already started to go a little bit down, uh, I think, in the past few days. But, but they are essentially laughing themselves to sleep every day because everybody, of course, wants to run their generative AI on top of their GPUs. And, and some other suppliers, of course, that's supplying these, these GPUs that are so cru crucial for infrastructure as well. But these, these cycles are expensive. And if everybody at the offices starts to use uh, JetGPT and all the other generative AI solutions on a daily basis for all sorts of useful and sometimes slightly less useful purposes, then you start to realize that you're burning a lot of cycles here. And that's, first of all, a very cost-effective thing. That's, that's annoying. Uh, it's not cost-effective, right? So, so this has putting a very much a burden on, on your cost. And then secondly, we still want to be more sustainable companies as well. And we realize that, that GPUs and AI in general demands a lot of energy and is producing a lot of CO2. And that's not exactly the net zero journey that we're all envisioning, right? And is, is, is then generative AI delivering so much value to the company? including sustainability that is justified by all the money that we put in it, but also all the, let's say, environmental impact that it brings? Well, that's very much uh, uh, the question. Then, of course, there's a lot of uh, uncertainties around uh, intellectual property. Um, you know, um, is, is it really ready for production? Um, is, is, it, is it actually shielded against malicious use as well? We all know the hallucinations that AI can come up with, particularly generative AI can come up with hallucinations. So there's a whole sorts of different reasons why, if you, if you currently look uh, at the VC climate, so venture capital, the big investors, the, the ones that really invest in the big companies, uh, m most of them, to our knowledge, are not currently investing in generative AI yet. And that is a very interesting situation because you would expect them to do so, but it's not the case. If you look around it, they're all like, well, wait a minute, this might not be ready for big time yet, so we're not investing that much. So of course, there's a lot of VC capital going in it, but if you look at the big guys, the really big ones, the Andreessen and Horowitzes of this world, the big VCs, you actually see that there is clearly a reluctance to, to invest a lot in it uh, already. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Do we have confidence enough in AI is actually the big question. And that's uh, a little bit what I want to address with you the rest of my speech as well. What does it take to have more confidence in AI so that we can actually, as enterprise architects, as architects, maybe in the, in the future as certified AI architects, would be able to create an AI solution that we can have confidence in and that actually will be uh, used. So now, now's the funny thing with architects, and I've always seen the same thing. You, you can have two approaches to this. If I look around and I look a little bit in the industry, but also with our own architects, and I ask them, what's the impact on architecture? And of course, a lot of them come up with diagrams like this. I know there's architects in the room. Uh, sorry, it's not in Archimate. I'm sorry. But, uh, but uh, hey, some people are, are simply not evangelized yet, apparently. So, so they come up with this stuff. But, but the thing is, it's always the same, right? It's just a whole series of boxes. Now we have a few additional boxes. So we need to manage multiple models. We need to manage an infrastructure also on the cost and on the sustainability of it. And we need to have some guardrails in terms of, you know, securing that, that it won't do things that we don't want to do at an enterprise scale and make it available. And then, of course, there's also ethics and compliance, regulatory compliance that is coming up. And, and we need to ensure that that is covered with as well. So what do you do? You augment your architectural pictures that you already use for data platforms, and you add some of the necessary stuff in terms of how you store your models, how you fine-tune your models, how you match foundation models with some of the models you've built yourself, how you can have a prompt hub, you know, prompt engineering, and how you can have a database of it uh, so that it's optimized and that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, which is one of the things you want to do with architecture. So th this is the typical almost Pavlov type of reaction that we get from a lot of architects. Oh, we're going to augment our architectural diagrams. Doesn't it look swell? I see a lot of people taking pictures of it as well, but, but uh, I, I use it actually as an example of I'm not so sure. If we want, so, so maybe if you want to do, use it in the same way. 
Um, and, then, and then on top of it, you could have reference implementations. And, and this is a, a little platform we, for example, build ourselves, which we call RACE, which is some sort of fancy acronym with AI in it. Got to, got to have AI in it, right? Um, but, but this is all about the ability to have a, a already functioning infrastructural layer. A, hey, this, this all should be very well known, of course, to architects. We have a, a very clear uh, services layer on top of it. And then if we actually want to build solutions, we realize that's a whole series of gener generic solutions that we already have in a reference implementation. And we have them ready to use so, so we don't you know, waste too much time in reinventing the wheel over and over again. I would say this is one approach to doing it. Yeah, we're going to augment our architectural templates and, and our models, our data models, and then we're going to build maybe some reference implementations on top of it. Let's do it with Azure. Let's do it with AWS. Let's do it with Google. Maybe some open source variant as well, and then, and then we have it up and running, and then on top of it, we can do miracles and everything is solved, right? Because we have architectural diagrams and a catalog of services. Um, the other approach is, uh, is more based on uh, design principles. And, and frankly, I like that uh, more. I've always been in the architectural camp, right? We have two ways of doing it. Here's a taxonomy, here's a structure, here's a diagram versus here's a mindset. Here's a set of principles. I'm not sure what it will lead to, but if we create something, here are the principles that we apply to it. More or less like a playbook or a checklist, if you like. So what I would like to introduce to you is a, is a playbook that we have been discussing ourselves. And it's based on this idea of, it's one thing to have uh, an AI that actually functions well, but if, if, is that enough? Is good, in, is good AI actually enough to be useful? Uh, we think there's a misunderstanding there. There's a discrepancy between what we consider good AI in terms of it, it you know, performs according to a benchmark and delivers versus is it actually useful for at enterprise scale? And I think that's the architect's concern to, uh, to deliver on that. So um, we, we believe so. So first of all, you, of course, you need AI that works, right? Uh, but we think there are three additional dimensions to it. First of all, it doesn't only need to work. It needs to work reliably, which means an, under all sorts of different circumstances, not just the ones from our benchmark or our test scripts. We need to have an AI that is much more aligned to human expectations. Remember, augment me. So, so we need to understand the human expectation and the perspective when we look at AI and is it successful and, and is it actually successfully implemented. And then, of course, thirdly, we need an AI that is working in the best of people's interests. So, so I believe that the me part of augment me is a very crucial thing. And you're not going to deliver that necessarily to start with, with architectural components. You're starting with a cookbook, a playbook, a set of design principles that you can apply to your portfolio of activities. So that's what we have for you. So, so if you have a download urge by now for capgemini.com slash technovision, you also may want to look then for this playbook, which again is something that is completely open. We're most happy to share it with the outside world. And it's not, it's, and again, you don't need to sell your soul to, the, to whoever in order to actually get a copy. You just, you know, Google it. Again, do it afterwards, do it afterwards. But uh, you can Google it and you can find it immediately and download it. This is uh, something that has been created by our uh, generative AI lab. Some of you that know Capgemini well may even know uh, Robert, Robert Engels, who is uh, the guy that, uh, that's heading up our, uh, our worldwide um, generative AI futures lab, as we call it. And one of the things that they, they have been uh, creating over there was literally based on this idea of what does it actually take in practice to, to have this thing uh, up and running? Um, to have AI solutions that we can actually have confidence in versus this idea of, well, you know, it's good. It, it is 99.5% accurate, so what's the problem, right? And we realized it's much more a matter of mindset and design principles, if you like, and, and design principles you can put in a playbook. So, so um, uh, I have 12 for the, of them for you. I, I will do a, a bit of cherry picking because, uh, hey, I only have my 40 minutes. And Steve just said, if you have questions, you need to ask them right now as well, because we do need to leave this afternoon, unfortunately. Cannot be in the panel discussion. But, but we said, well, there's one thing in terms of proven accuracy. OK, it, it, it scores on a certain benchmark, and th there we are. But we believe, as I said, that there are three ar other areas as well. So it needs to be, first of all, um, a reliability, right? So, so we need uh, AI that actually works uh, reliably. Then we need stuff that is aligned to human expectations. 
and we need stuff that is actually um, doing things in, in our best interests as individuals, as an enterprise. So we, dis we define 12 different areas, 12 different big principles that we worked out in a playbook. And they all look the same, so to give you a view of what is inside, uh, for every of these 12 principles that cover these three areas, on top of having proven accuracy, you know, that reliability is in, in, in the people's best interest uh, and it's aligned to our expectations. So each one, uh, every of these 12, we define on, on two pages. So this is an example. We had a lot of experts uh, that worked with us. As I said, we, you need to not only show your sources, but also the people that contributed to, to it. So, so we always do this deliberately. It's the same in Technovision, by the way, where we do the same. We define a trend, but we also show the person that's behind it, that, that you can reach out to and work with on that specific trend. Well, we've done the same for the design principles as well. So here we have Tijana, who happens, by the way, to live in the Netherlands, and, and could reach out to her if you want to know more about the fact that proven accuracy is not the only thing that will make AI successful. Although you would think so with all of the, the benchmarks that are currently going on. And, and, then, and then there's a new model, a new version of a model, and scores even better, right? Oh, okay, in that case, we need that one. And we believe that if we have the one that scores the best in terms of performance of the model, then we're done, right? Then we've done our work, and uh, it's far from that. So, so there's a, uh, there's a, um, a one-liner, there is an elevator pitch, and then we go a little bit deeper, and it's more or less the same as we do in the, if you know Technovision, you'll see a similar construct over there, so we want to understand a little bit why are we interested in this specific design principle. Then we're going to dive a little bit into it, what is actually the complexity of this? What does it take to, to actually you know, deal with this specific, specific principle. And then there's a series of recommendations. Um, this is what you could be doing next. It's a playbook, after all. So we want to have tangible advice on how to do things. And then finally, obviously, need to have clickable links. So there's research here, and you're interested in further research. Uh, if you want to know more about it, hey, here are great things to click on. So each and every of these 12 principles we have fleshed out in the playbook, like, like we've done over here as an example. Now, again, if I would have another hour, <laughs> I, I would dive into each and every one of them, but I would just want to give you a flavor of these principles, so we understand a little bit better why it's not only about proven accuracy, but there's much more to it in order to make AI that we can have confidence in. And that is what this playbook really is, uh, is all about. So first of all, uh, by the way, it still insists this is a cake, by the way. This is a delicious cake. I'm not sure what's in it. Uh, as long as there's no coriander in it, uh, I'm, I would be fine with it, uh, the devil's herb. But uh, anyway, it looks a little green to me. But first of all, proven accuracy. This is actually where we make our point. Don't, don't believe, don't believe that that's just because um, you know, the, the AI is good in terms of a benchmark means that it's the best. And you, we all know these benchmarks, right? I'm pretty sure you just follow the... the you know, the IT news, and, and you see a new model. So, so whether it's GPT or, or Gemini or Llama, uh, you know, or one of the open source models, and, and they try to outsmart each other. You know, we have 99.59, well, we have 99.61, right? And they try to outsmart each other in terms of accuracy. And, and the thing is, it can give a very false sense of, of confidence. There's an example in the playbook in terms of, for example, a, a well-known case, I believe, in the UK in terms of, of cancer research in which AI was used. And it did a lot of false, false diagnostics simply based on a performance benchmark that was applied to it. And, and it led to a, a, a whole series of false flex diagnoses and a whole series of unnecessary and even painful uh, type of uh, activities that were a result of it. And, and, you know, bothering a lot of people as a result of it simply because, because people didn't look at the entire context of the AI, but just looked at the, the, the benchmark uh, of, of the AI being able to recognize the situation, but not understanding the context that was around it. So, so these performance benchmarks, hey, this AI is good because it has 99.6, is, is not saying that much. And that is the whole point of the, of the whole playbook, actually, as well. Uh, proof and accuracy, we need more than that. Uh, for example, if we look at AI that is uh, more reliable, uh, you first want to think about robustness, and robustness really means uh, you could, you could m of course, mess with, particularly, we, know, we all know that generative AI particularly 
is, uh, is, is probabilistic, right? It means it's just bluffing its way with, with beautiful language, but it's actually bluffing. And, and you try, for example, to create your own biography and ask ChatGPT. I'm sure many of you have done it, right? Just ask ChatGPT, give me a bio of Andra Sakal, you know, and you get the stuff. It begins with, yeah, I recognize it, and suddenly you solved world hunger, right? And uh, worked for, for all sorts of companies you've never heard of, but hey, you were very successful. So you're inclined to show your parents, look, look, look how good I am, ChatGPT says. I've, done all of the, I've won all of these awards. I, I saw in my biography, I won all sorts of awards. I'm not aware of them, but I'm, I'm intent to collect them later on. But uh, I didn't know, I, I won these awards. So the thing is, we know that AI can hallucinate, and if you know how it works, you can also feed it with malicious input, and, and it would actually create something uh, that is not just a joke, like, like a false biography, but actually, doing something malicious. So, so if we look at AI, even if it performs perfect against the benchmark, the question is, is it robust against malicious type of things as well? So that's one, robustness is clearly one that we uh, uh, better need for it. Then there's dependability, which all has to do with timing. And, and I think we need to really realize this. I mean, you can't always use what we nowadays see as generative AI. People seem to think that's, that's sort of a super AI that can deal with it all, right? Well, you, you try to put it in an autonomous car, and it's driving with uh, 100 or something on the highway, and then it needs to make a split-second decision. Then, then I think your chat GPT that, that would say, you, you really think you know, this is the right way to do on the highway, and it talks to you, it's not exactly what you want, right? You need, you need an AI that is able to perform within literally that split second and do something. And we're not going to use a large language model for that, rest assured, in order to do that. Often there's a, some sort of a cascading system uh, in here that uh, engineers know very well, right? Uh, it all depends on the time frame that you have, and if it's literally in terms of microseconds, uh, you, you want to be able to go back to something extremely simple like if then else, a decision tree. If that's your final line of defense, this is what you will do, right? And, and nothing else in terms of let's see if a fancy AI can do it. It just takes half a second and it's too long. So there's a cascading set of things over here, and you need a system in place that realizes the dependability in terms of timing. And, and again, can have a brilliant benchmark, just takes a few seconds to answer, that's not what you want. You, you, you need to take into account the timing, and, and that means that you go back to, to simpler things. Um, it's, it's a notion of uh, what some people, by the way, call traditional AI. I found that hilarious. I was at a seminar not too long ago, there was a guy from uh, Honeywell, nobody from Honeywell? today here. Well, this was a young guy from Honeywell, and, and he had this brilliant way of saying, well, we also have traditional AI. So that's everything else except generative AI. And he was a little bit, it's a tradition thing. It's like, like you're over here in Edinburgh, right? And you're wearing your kilt, eating haggis, and, and talk about traditional AI, right? So that's a little bit of flavor that came out of it. But funnily enough, when it's cascading, and when you need to do, react in split seconds, you may want very traditional AI to actually deal with the situation, right? So, so that's a, a very important aspect of it. And then, of course, stability is very interesting in terms of stuff like model drifts. So the models first worked perfectly. Now uh, additional training material uh, is, is uh, fed into the machine learning machine. And then, and then sooner or later, the model starts to drift. And, and you want to ha actually have a, um, let's say, a, a real-time deaf AI ops type of situation in which you're able to keep controlling the model and see if it still performs according to uh, what you're looking for. So model drift and, and ensuring some sort of stability requires a platform, let's say, architecture that, is, that goes way beyond having that model work when you tested it, but it actually needs to be a, a stable platform. So there's really much more to it. Um, you, you see more and more of these uh, technologies pop up, right? We saw, for example, uh, Google just recently came up with uh, Vertex, which is their agent builder. And there's all sorts of different ways to create AI agents. And, and uh, there is a lot there in, in terms of, as I said, some of the robustness and, and dependability areas there as well. But, but also in terms of I want to be able to have confidence in it. So, so they are actually using grounding. And grounding means I give an answer, but I can also provide you with the sources where this actual stuff came from. I've based it on grounded materials. Of course, it came through Google search because that's their, clearly their intention, but it's a good thing in terms of, well, we have a result over here, but it's grounded in, in certain search results that you used to trust in the, in the past, right? 
So it's not just made up. I actually used these grounded sources to, to uh, base my, uh, my response on. So that there's far more over there also in terms of being uh, aligned to human expectations. I, I like particularly the notion of uh, humility. And uh, humility, uh, we, we often like people, we, we like their, um, we trust people if, if they also very clearly show what they don't master. We like that more often than the fact that somebody sort of radiates, I know it all, right? But in fact, you want to trust in humility, so, so I think we need AI systems that also don't overestimate themselves, but actually are able to say, I couldn't answer that, I don't know. I'm just a probabilistic engine over here. I don't know, right? I don't know. And, and we call that humility. So AI, that's actually, uh, you know, we we'll have to work a little bit on the humility of AI systems, I would say, these days. But it's one of these big things that we currently see arise. Uh, if, if, if you're not able to answer it, or if you want to fail successfully, gracefully, as we call it, failing gracefully. I love that one as well. Did I have it over here? Yeah, there it is. Failing gracefully. I mean, humans can sort of take multiple steps in terms of failing on something, and then we can sweeten it and, and sort of feels good. Uh, what if AI could fail gracefully as well in unexpected circumstances, right? So that's another one that, uh, that is uh, very much uh, defined in the playbook. As I said, we don't have too much time for it. Explainability is a very interesting one. Our, our ability to actually explain how it all came to be, but also realizing, I, I like this one in the playbook, but, but I would put something against it as well. Be because at a certain point in time with transformer models, for example, Deep learning is already difficult enough to understand. Now you put attention mechanisms on top of it and transformer models. It's begun to get very uh, difficult to explain that, right? So, so sometimes you need to, to you, you know, take a more sensible approach, trying to focus on the essentials of, of the way you do it, an algorithm, rather, rather than taking the engineering approach of let me guide you through deep learning, neural networks, and then, and then also understanding the intention mechanism and transformers, how they work. So now, now, you, now, now we explained it, right? It's not exactly where you want to go. But there are certain models. We work a lot with Mistral. Capgemini is a French company, so we like to work with startups that are, well, French. And Mistral is, is a French, very much based on open source, which we all should like here a little bit, I think. I mean, open AI, that, that's, it should have been called closedai.com or something, but it's actually open AI, right? But it isn't open. And, and, and then you have companies like Mistral that say, well, you know, we give complete openness in terms of how this stuff works, not only in terms of the models, but also the data it has been sourcing to train on, right? So that's another, uh, I think, important one. And then finally, I think a few areas that we are already aware of, but, but I think as architects, we need to apply these design principles as well. Of course, it, it, it pertains to fairness. I happen to see a few people here from the Netherlands. You might even be confronted with more Dutch English soon, maybe after my speech even. Uh, but but so, so we have these scandals every now and then, right? We have the benefit scandal in the Netherlands, which is very well, you know, based on, on let's say, biased algorithms that, that sort of uh, unjustified picked out people and, and uh, you know, um, uh, thought they were fraudulent. But also the famous case with Amazon, of course, that, that used it to hire people and then found out in the training data they'd be used that they have been a, a clearly a bias towards males versus females. And it's like looking in the mirror, right? AI simply shows us what we've been doing in the past because it's historical data. And if we look in the mirror, the AI mirror, and we see something that we don't like, it's not AI's fault. We, we, feed, we fed it literally what we've been doing in the past. Turns out we're biased. Turns out we're not fair. We haven't been fair in the past, and now AI provides us with that mirror and actually shows it right into our face, right? So this is actually the very I nice thing about AI. It shows us things that we didn't even realize before. But now it's undisputable, right? Now, now we can no longer deny it. It's another elephant in the room, if you like. There's privacy, obviously. We need to take that into account. Uh, maybe we can use synthetic data, federated learning, differential privacy, all of these different methodologies that can ensure that, that we haven't really been processing personal data because privacy is, is a big thing in this as well. And then finally, of course, sustainability. How can we build in into our architectural approaches that are actually sustainable and, and actually realize the environmental impact of AI? AI can be used to deliver positive climate impact, I guess, uh, if, if we have the, these algorithms and these machine, um, you know, these machine models. But on the other hand, it clearly has its own environmental impact as well. 
and, and there are a, a whole series of smaller models that are more lightweight that actually underpin that. So, so we're very much interested in the small being the new big. And uh, this idea of, well, we've even ingested more data to create a more superior model so that it's more accurate and it goes to 99.7% is actually maybe not um, really what we're looking for because in our best interest might be to choose a much more lightweight model that is focused on a very specific area. That, that's really what I wanted to convey to you today, uh, just to whet your appetite a little bit for the playbook. We're sharing it. I believe that, that focusing on the design principles from an architectural perspective is more interesting than, uh, than the diagrams, frankly. Of course, I was already discussing this morning, there's EU regulation coming up. That's helpful, because sometimes that's, that's simply also in terms of certification, not only of people, but also the principles that we've been applying to creating our AI solutions is not something that would be nice and purposeful, it's actually something we will need very soon, at least in the EU and no doubt anywhere else in the world as well, in different formats, but surely something comparable, we'll see that as well. So, so uh, you know that there's more coming, so again, the, the playbook, you can download it, as I said. I believe we'll see very much more happening in the future, and uh, if we're talking about ecosystems, if you think about the next generation of AI devices, like the until now little bit failed uh, Huma, the Humane AI pin, but also the, the Rabbit R2, Internet Whispers, or you're just in your Tesla and talking to your, your, your audio system, right? Um, uh, behind that, we'll, we'll see stuff like multi-agent, multi-expertise, multi-modal type of AI systems, and they'll be like an ecosystem. In order to get a job done, AI that we have confidence in, we, we need more than that generative language model, right? But instead, we need a whole, I would say, mesh of different AI agents that have different capabilities, that have different, let's say, accuracy level, that have different robustness level, that may even have different sustainability level, and they would all be working together in an ecosystem, if you like. So isn't that nice? What a coincidence. The notion of ecosystem and a mesh actually merging soon together with the notion of AI. I believe we will need that type of mesh as an ecosystem to actually get these things done. So we ask something fancy from the, the, the Rabbit R2, right? But in the end, we find that it's, it takes a whole mesh of, of agents working together to fulfill that promise. So really what I wanted to bring uh, to you, um, we were fascinated by travel in uh, the space. Uh, I began with that, and, and uh, we need AI in space. For example, uh, some of you are from India, we had a very successful landing, the moon lander, finally, Shandyan 3 was, was finally successful, landing on the moon. It used AI on board, actually do it and recognize the situation and the terrain and do it in real time. Not exactly a GPT, jet GPT model on board, rest assured. It's not like jet GPT talking to you, how do you think we're doing the moon landing? How do you feel currently? Can you write a poem about it? Can you translate this to another language? I don't think it was on board. This was traditional AI consumed with a little bit of haggis, but actually did its job, right? So, so there's much more to it than, uh, than, uh, than generative AI. Hey, there are people involved here. As I said, need to take your sources, but also your contributors. So here is, uh, is Robert and Mark that were the editors in chief of this thing. Do reach out to them if you want to know more about it. And we had a whole, we had a whole bunch of uh, uh, people, experts, and residents that contributed to the whole thing as well. Let's end with a person. Let's end with a person. I'm already a few minutes late. Sorry about that, Steve. But um, This is, of course, Captain Kirk, William Shatner, and he's very well known from Star Trek. I'm more Star Wars type, by the way. Um, you know, you have Star Trekies and Star Wars types, but hey, Star Trek, very nice as well. He was actually out in space, right, with Blue Horizon, the Jeff Bezos thing, and he was there, and everybody asked him, now you as a spaceship captain, you must have utterly enjoyed space, right? And he had the same overview effect that so many others had as well. He said, listen, I looked into space, it was dead and cold and I felt nothing. And then I looked back at Earth and I realized that it's all about Earth over there and I couldn't care less about the galaxy outside there because there's nothing there for us really. It's there on Earth that we actually found out about. And hopefully we will treat AI like that as well with some architectural guidance and actually have stuff that augments us but particularly augments us as individuals. Thank you very much for bearing me this morning.
Sorry about that, Steve. I, I, nope, I took nope, the no problem, time. Ron. No problem. Thank I needed you. to introduce Captain Kirk because of I'm, course you know, he's important. Yeah, yeah please take a seat, and we'll uh, sure, sure. we'll get to. Uh, I won't get to all of the questions. No, but, um, I'll, I'll be around. We'll get to some. A few hours, it's so. funny your um, your comments about the the um, the bios that that can be created with it. Did you um, did you yourself? Well, no, I didn't. But oh, um, last week, a member of my family told me that ChatGPT says that Steve Nunn led the Open Group. He was the CEO of he the was. Open Group in the past tense, so they know something <laughs> that I don't yet. So um, Scary stuff. It is a bit scary, yeah, yeah, yeah the scariness of it. So, um, but no awards? No awards you uh, won, that you were I don't aware? know. That was the bit that he focused on, I'm pretty sure you would be award winning. Well, well let's hope so okay. at some point. Um, a number of questions on the sustainability topic. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick one. Um, Ha any thoughts on how to deal at the same time with the wide and increasing use of AI and sustainability? For example, ChatGPT apparently consumes half a liter of water for a set of five to 50 prompts. Yeah, and, and creating false bios, right? And that will right. yes, already exactly. consume water yeah. and energy. Yeah, so, so, so what we in the playbook very, very much describe in detail, I couldn't dive into it today, but what we describe in detail are a whole series of things you can do. For example, choose models that are much more focused on one specific thing. If, if you want to, um, you know, bake a cake, you're not interested in um, imitating Shakespeare, right, in a text. You're, you have very specific tasks you want to do, so you could choose more lightweight models. Uh, I, I think that's a choice currently, so small is the new big, we like that. You could have uh, optimized hardware that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I was talking a few things about NVIDIA, but they're actually focusing on creating hardware that is much more environmental friendly. And then so somehow, you, of course, you need to work a little bit on the business case. Are, are we are all using enthusiastic stuff like ChatGPT and many more you know, co-pilots to come for all sorts of different activities. Mm. Does it actually deliver the value to justify the environmental impact of it? Right. And that is the architectural balance act that we all need to go through, probably. I think a lot of people are ex experimenting with it, yeah. understandably, without really... Burning up the planet the while doing so, yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, as... IA created content becomes common on the internet. Many yeah. LLM models will use more of this as input data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they just going to converge into a black hole? The, it, <laughs> it's a very interesting thing, right? So, so you make up something like Steve used to be yeah. the chairman of the open group, and, yeah. and it becomes something that might be ingested again mm -hmm. by, by a machine learning model, right? And then it becomes part of a fake reality that is being created more and more. I, I think in the playbook we, we realize very much so. For example, um, grounding your responses and understanding where it comes from might be very important. And, and you would rely on the Reuters of this world or what have you versus this idea of I just got it from the internet so it must be true, right? No, but it's, it's, it's something that, that we've never seen before, of course, uh, in our society and in technology that we can create an alternative reality that we feed again in the machine learning model, and, and then what is real anymore? And, and 100 years it's from awesome. now, who knows? Steve, Steve, none used to chair yeah, the open group back, in 23. Who knows? In who 23. Knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank it's you. It's a very good one, but very, very difficult. A conundrum, I would say, to deal with. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just yeah, pick sorry. one more. So apologies to uh, anyone who I didn't get I'm, to. I'm still around, so. Um, Absolutely. So, um, let's see. It's on the confidence and trust in AI topic. Uh, do you think trust will ever be used about an AI, or will it only ever be reliability? Will it be measured in reliability? Can you ever say, talk about trust in a machine? I, I think so. I, I think the whole playbook actually is about having confidence in AI, which might also pertain to, for example, it's sustainable. For example, it is fair. Uh, for example, it is sensible to its context, right? And, and doesn't mm -hmm. just focus on its own subject matter, but sees a bigger picture. So, so actually, I, I believe that, that just having confidence based on accuracy, I think it's the whole, the whole pitch more or less right. tries to convey this idea of that's not enough, mm -hmm. but actually needs to understand much more. And these 12 principles, I think, are, are just the start of understanding the broader context. And we realize it's not just about the accuracy of it. But actually, there's much more. Ron, we'll leave it there. But thank yeah. you, as ever, for a, a, a thought-provoking and entertaining presentation. I, I hope so. Thank you. Ron Toledo, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, sir.